Okay, welcome to a lecture about chapter two in our rigging textbook. So wire rope and wire rope slings. Uh, you might not think something as uh, simple as a, as a piece of wire rope would be as complex as it is, but there's quite a bit to it. You can break it down into components. Uh, the core, which is the center of the, uh, of the structure, and the strands, which are, and the term that uh, they like to use is laid. It's uh, laid around the core. Then the wires are twisted together and formed into the strands. The uh, diameter is measured uh, in terms of a circle, and I think you guys have had an opportunity to use a whoa to use a micrometer in uh, in the mechanical class. But you can see the difference in these measurements. The correct way to take it is. Well, it would be the largest dimension. In other words, this reading over here would give you a a smaller reading, which uh, would be not correct. So the materials that are used, probably the one that uh, might be uh, Unknown to you would be the Monel or Monel, uh, which is a, a trademark material, and it's uh, it's used quite a bit in various ac uh, applications. But according to our text, it belongs to Huntington Alloys Incorporated. So, so some sort of a, a combination of metals that uh, they developed. But probably the most widely used is the high carbon steel. So the core serves as the, uh, the foundation that gives a support to the strands, something for them to be wound on. And it can be either some natural material, synthetic, and uh, steel. So you have fiber cord, fiber core, independent wire rope core and wire strand core are all different uh, different types of cores. So this, the description of the of the wire rope will will tell you what kind of core it is. So the uh, uh, the wires are are uh, laid in a strand, and then the uh, strands are laid around the core. And you have, and this is on page 19 of your book, and we'll look at the slide here in a minute. But this shows you the uh, right lay, left lay, regular lay, and the lang lay, and that really has to do with the direction that the, the strands are wound around the core. So a lay is considered the length that it takes for a strand to make one complete helical wrap around the core. So here we see a, an example of that. In order for it to, if you start measuring at this point, and you get to that same point again, that would be considered one lay. And you can see the difference between the right, the left, the lang.
the difference in the uh, the lays here regular lay as opposed to lang lay well the right and the left just refer to the the direction that the uh, that the strands are are running in but the regular and the lang has to do with the angle of the wires that make up the the individual wires here you can see are all roughly parallel to the axis of the rope itself whereas on the the Langley, the wires are at various angles. So that's what that uh, regular versus Langley has to do with. Classifications tell you the number of strands in the rope and how many wires are in each strand. So a 6 by 37 rope would have six strands and each of the strands is made up of 37 wires. And uh, here's where the word nominal comes in. In uh, I know in building construction, when you go out and you buy a 2 by 4 piece of wood, it's not actually 2 inches by 4 inches. It's uh, something less than that. So the, uh, the nominal comes into play here because... Well, for example, 6 by 19 means you have six strands, and each made up of somewhere from 15 to 26 uh, wires in each strand, with no more than 12 outside wires. The most common, commonly used uh, wire rope is 6 by 19 and 6 by 37 for hoists and cranes. And here's some different uh, patterns. These are cross-sectional views. Just to give you some idea. And strength. There's different grades you have, uh, well, plow steel, which is no longer used, so that's not even on here. So then the lowest grade now is improved plow steel, followed by extra improved plow steel. And uh, if you can guess what EEIP is, it's extra, extra improved plow steel. And you can have either uh, a fiber core or independent wire rope core for the improved plus steel. Finishes for wire rope. Uh, bright, which is not coated, is probably the most common. Galvanized, which is coated to protect it from corrosion. It uh, can be used, but the process of galvanizing it reduces its strength by 10%. The uh, catalog listings are going to show the nominal strength. You want to divide the nominal strength by, des by, the, design fa by the design factor to find out what the working uh, strength is. In other words, what is the maximum load you can put on that? So for as an example, if you have the nominal strength of 6,800 pounds, and we talked about a typical design factor of 5, you would divide the nominal strength by uh, by five and that would tell you what the maximum working load strength would be. So let's see, five in the 6800 gives you five, it gives you one, uh, three, 136, 13, 1360. Uh, that's a tough one. 6,800 divided by 5. Yeah, 1,360 pounds would be the maximum load that you would want to put on that. There's various things that can affect the strength. If you uh, bend the wire rope over some kind of a curved surface, 
you have to uh, you have to allow for well there's a there's an equation uh, the D to D ratio and the big D is the uh, curved surface that you're you're bending it over and the small d is the the nominal diameter of the rope and we have a we have a graph down here that shows you shows you the efficiency here as the ratio gets uh, smaller the uh, the efficiency or the, the the strength of the rope uh, goes down closer to 100 percent efficiency you are the better off you are uh, temperature can also affect it either hot or cold depending on the the material you're using corrosion things in the environment uh, if you have gases or liquids that are uh, corrosive in nature, you can reduce the strength of the rope. And then the fittings or the terminations under some conditions can also reduce the strength of the of the rope. So here's an example. If you have a, a fiber core, 6 by 37, improved plow steel, 1 inch diameter, that would be the small d, and you are putting it over a sheave of 30 inches diameter. See so your d to d ratio in that case would be 30 to 1 or 30. So you'd probably be looking at, uh, I don't know, 94, 95 percent efficiency. So you'd want to figure that into your maximum load calculation. <clears throat> so breaking down those factors a little bit more, temperature, uh, fiber core should not be exposed to anything more than 180 degrees Fahrenheit. The core could be uh, greatly weakened by that. And any uh, sling that's going to be exposed to a temperature higher than 400 or a temperature lower than negative 60 degrees uh, needs to have the you need to check the manufacturer's data to make sure that it's it's going to work at those temperatures if nothing else it'll tell you how much it's weakened by that temperature and corrosion that comes from either being an environment that's uh, really dirty or has corrosive materials in it or just not taking care you know, properly lubricating the parts of the of the rigging system. And you may not be able to see it. Uh, anytime you see little pits on the wire, it should be taken out of service. And we already mentioned caustic chemicals can cause problems. Fittings and terminations, they can either be spliced into the loop or fastened to uh, some kind of a fitting. If strength of the fitting is not at least that of the rope, the usable strength is reduced, and this goes back to what we talked about early on. The uh, the maximum load that you can carry in any system is going to be based on the the weakest part of that system. So the usable strength of the rope is going to depend on what fittings are attached to it too. And here's a bunch of uh, examples of fittings for you. And we'll talk a little bit, a little, a little bit more about each of those. Speltered socket. This is speltered is probably not a word that you you hear very often. It's a form of welding, really. Molten zinc is, is poured into the socket and wells them into place. So a swaged socket and is, is 
clamped on with a high pressure hydraulic press. And we saw in that, uh, that diagram that both of those can result in 100% efficiency. But of course, that, that assumes that they're done correctly and properly by experienced personnel. Probably not something a wind turbine technician is going to do uh, very often, if ever. But it's nice to be aware of it. Here's a graphic. Uh, shows you another common way to uh, put terminations on a wire rope. Using these clips, pretty straightforward. There's a couple different types, but they uh, they both accomplish the same thing. And you, of course, got the right way and the wrong way to attach the clips for maximum strength. top one is the right way, the two bottom ones are the wrong way. And these can be used to make uh, slings on the job site. And how many clips you use, the way they're spaced, and the size all matters. They have to be appropriate and those specifications will be, uh, will be given by the manufacturer. How much they're tightened also matters. If you over tighten them, you could damage the rope. If they're not tight enough, of course, they could slip. And the size of the loop, which is the eye and the thimble. And the thimble is that uh, this part here that fits in, acts, to, uh, acts as a form to give you that loop, and it also protects the the wire rope from being uh, being worn against something. So it does the same thing a thimble and sewing does really. It protects your finger when you sew something. Here it's protecting the rope. A white socket is another method of uh, making a wire rope sling. And here's some terminology that you'll see used uh, in rope handling and in rigging sometimes. The live end and the dead end are self-explanatory. And it's giving you some, some rules here. You have to have enough dead end here to allow for a certain amount of slippage. The angles have to be correct. And it has to be put on correctly. So, if uh, if you need to uh, cut one of these, you're going to want to make sure that the uh, ropes are uh, or the strands are wired into place before you do so. So cutting, splicing, those probably aren't things that you're going to uh, find yourself doing. This would be the sort of thing experienced riggers would, uh, would get into. But it's fairly obvious these strands can come loose once they're cut, so you would want to bind them in place using annealed wire. Splicing, you're actually weaving strands together and uh, a great deal of training and experience is required before you do this. So this is the sort of thing you would probably go through some kind of a apprenticeship process and lots of practice before you're going to be in a position to actually splice these things together. Here's an example of a couple of different hitches. Obviously, you can see the, the benefit of using 
this sort of an arrangement as opposed to this one. Uh, you're trying to move this same load, say it's a, a length of pipe, and you used a, well, even if you used a choker hitch, you would have to be in the exact center of gravity in order to make that work. Or you'd probably have to have a couple of tag lines on it to, to keep it stable. Whereas this is going to uh, be much more stable. I'll call your attention to this. This here is a Greek letter, theta, that's used to represent the angle. We said uh, in the last chapter that we wanted to keep our angles uh, greater than 45 degrees. And we'll do a little exercise to, uh, to look into why that is. This table is giving you information on uh, rated load capacities. And note that it, uh, these values are based on slings being vertical. If they are not vertical, the rated load that is, the rated capacity shall be reduced. Uh, if two or more slings are used, the greatest vertical angle between the slings shall also be considered. These values only apply when the D to D ratio for MS or S slings is 40 or greater, up to one inch diameter. Uh, so there's a lot of qualifications in here. These are given basically for, for vertical lifts, straight up. As soon as you put an angle in there, you're causing, you're causing more stress, more tension. Uh, so if you want to actually allow for angles, you would take the vertical rated load times the load times the sine of the angle that you're lifting at. And this L actually stands for number of legs. And we'll do some examples like that in class. Uh, if you start to add more than two, if you have three or more legs, it's hard to figure out how much, how much load each of the legs is bearing. So it's, it's always best to use an equation for two just to be safe. And then if you have a four-leg sling, you should only use the manufacturer's rating if you're positive that each of the legs is going to bear an equal part of the load. If you're using a choker hitch, that's the one that clamps down as you lift up. If the angle is between 90 and 119 degrees, you're going to want to use 87% uh, of the value shown. And the reason for that is that it's going to, the angle and the, whoops, the angle and the friction between the, uh, between the ropes is going to uh, cause extra stress on the rope. So for a vertical basket, the values in the table are based on using two vertical legs with a D to D ratio of 25 or greater. Remember, that's the ratio of the, the diameter of what you're, you're wrapping it around compared to the diameter of the wire. And that has to be at least 25. If you're only attaching it at a single point, as in 2-10A, which is this one. If you're only attaching at a certain point, you want to multiply the load by the sine of the angle. 
and you're going to want to use that uh, that ratio reduction again. Okay, as far as inspection, uh, they should be inspected daily before and during use. So as slings are being used, they should be uh, they should be watched, inspected, and then periodically, anybody that uh, uses slings routinely is going to have a designated individual to inspect them periodically and document that inspection. If you see any kind of kinking, crushing, unstranding, uh, bird caging, that's this uh, where it starts to kind of come apart, you're going to want to replace it. Any evidence of heat damage, splatter from welding, if there's any cracking or deforming of the, the end fittings, any pitting in the wires we mentioned before, any corrosion of the wire near the end fitting, uh, one broken or cut strand, not wire, strand. And then for a single rope, if you have 10 broken wires in a section, the length of one rope lay, and remember that's one helical turn around the rope, or if you have five broken in any one strand within one rope lay, that would come out of service. If you have braided wire that has less than eight parts, 20 broken wires in one rope lay or one broken uh, one broken brain, what's that? Or one broken strand per sling length. Oh, that should be braid. <laughs> or one broken braid. Or one broken strand per sling length. For braided wire with eight or more parts, 40 broken wires in one rope lay, or one broken braid, or two broken strands per sling length. Yeah, I don't expect you to memorize that, but uh, the, the key there is that there are standards. I, I have a feeling that uh, most people that do this routinely are not going to take a chance. If they have some broken wires, they're probably going to replace it as a uh, better option than <clears throat> continuing to use something that could fail uh, and cause pretty dramatic problems.